for today. This is actually the first center stage conversation. No, as much. Well, yes, today we will be uh, speaking with Marcello De Francisci. But this uh, conversation will be led by a moderator, Sean Hedinger. Um, not Hedinger, because some people were saying that. Our moderator for this center stage conversation number one. He is an Albuquerque-based podcast producer for Autovita Studios and a freelance TV film composer. He's written the Netflix theme song for the Chelsea Handler Show and custom music for projects by Fortnite, Star Wars, YouTube, and Amazon. Ooh. He has scored award-winning New Mexico films like Cop vs. Killer, The Post, and most recently, Angelito. As a synth nerd, he releases original 80s tinged electro pop as memory. That's memory with two Y's. Yeah, uh, he wrote that with two Y's. And he is currently working on a new LP titled The Phil Collins Divorce Album. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for your moderator for this conversation, Sean Hedinger. Hello and welcome. I'm going to sit down to read this. Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Well, wow. wait, you excited for the first center stage conversation? I am. Thank, thank you for uh, correctly saying my name too, Keith. I appreciate that, man. Okay, Marcello De Francisci has composed, produced music for an array of motion picture soundtrack scores, including Michael Mann's latest $90 million film, Ferrari, starring Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz. He also composed the piece Drums of Victory for Alexander Payne's five-time Academy Award-nominated film, Nebraska, Natalie Portman's first Western genre film, Jane Got a Gun, co-starring Ewan, how says, Ewan McGregor. Yes. In addition to acclaimed future documentary, documentary Samsara, which I saw was amazing, the sequel to Baraka, uh, he did that score, it's amazing. Marcello joined forces with world-renowned singer Lisa Gerard, Dead Can't Dance Band, alongside fan member Bone Globe winner for a co-composing score to Gladiator, alongside Hans Zimmer. And both, both him and Lisa co-wrote music for numerous film projects, amazing, amazing albums you guys should listen to. In addition, worked on two solo albums titled Departum and its successor, Exodia. He is a recipient of the pres prestigious Best Soundtrack of the Year Gang Award for Sony Computer Entertainment's first God of War video game. Apart from working in the film industry, Marcello is recognized as a record album producer, mixing, and mastering engineer who has collaborated with a variety of artists around the globe, including Music Hall of Fame guitarist Phil Manzanera from the iconic pop band Roxy Music. I love those guys. <clears throat> Ex member, front singer for the band Hoover Phonic, Nomi Wolf's two time Grammy winning soprano, Hila Plitman, and Macedonian singer Tanda, I'm not sure it says, Tavardowski, who performed on the soundtrack score to Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. He also mastered numerous soundtrack album releases for Lakeshore Record. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcello De Francisci. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. So I'll give you guys a little outline of what I'm thinking here. We'll kind of work through the process of working on a film score, and then we'll get some demos later. Does that work for you, Marcello? Take the lead, sir. Oh, Captain. So let's start at the beginning of the whole process. How do you find and land your composing jobs? Boy, you went straight to the, to the heart of it. No one is dead. Let's make money. Um, <laughs> it, you have to be in the right environment. So you have to place yourself in that environment to find what. And that environment doesn't necessarily have to be physical. There's a lot of resources today through the internet that you can uh, find what's the right market for your creative, uh, your creative tendencies um, musically. Part of it is networking, doing things like this. And a lot of times it's finding out where there's the people that you would like to collaborate with and finding a way to get into that circle. Um, sometimes it takes travel, um, but that's how you can know it. And then having the personality to be able to approach people and a great part of getting work is having a presence online that people can very easily access your work. You know, uh, in my case, I have uh, my YouTube channel and my website, which I'm continuously updating. And also, it's the work ethic. You know, if, you have, if you're producing material continuously, it's something to be excited about, which you share with people. So, you know, you, you start to grow your audience. You start to you talk to filmmakers that maybe they don't hire you when you meet them, but then two years down the road, they did a short, 
they get a bigger film, you've been in their radar. So it's, 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 it's a continuous process of, of putting the effort in to get your work done. Yeah. What is your early process getting in the mindset for the new project? Are there early demos involved or what tool do you use to prepare the groundwork? Well, but I, when somebody reaches out uh, or a project comes into my, my sphere, um, I do a lot of homework. I will actually find out who the producers are, who the directors are, I go online, I go on Google, I find out what they've worked on, I find out who they like as directors. For example, there's a lot of directors that are fans of other directors. So if I can find out who that director is a fan of, I know who the, chances are I already know who the composer is that's working with that director. And so I'll educate myself in the, and then I'll find out if the synopsis of the project. And so I'll find out if there's a genre or a style and I'll acquaint myself with two or three films that are in that genre and listen to the soundtracks of that genre. So by the time I start to get footage of the film, a lot of times I start to see that they've used the temp score of, this, of the soundtracks I've already listened to. And, you know, so I'm already 10 steps ahead and I already listen to the production, the approach, the architecture of the music they're using. And so that's, that's really helpful. And I have some samples today that I'll, that I'll show them that. That's great. Um, analytical mindset. And then as you begin to compose and demo, what's your process like for that? Are there specific instruments you're drawn to? Like, it all depends on the film. You know, I mean, I think the film, for example, I just finished a film that was shot in a park. So I had to, the, the, the producer, I worked with the producer very closely because the director was based on a park. So the producer told me, I, I, I was kind of stressed because I said, now I have to write Nepalese singers. But he said, I'm not looking for Nepalese singers. I want something to be more international. So I, I, I went online and started listening to a lot of Nepalese music, just so that I'd have that in the back of my mind as a, as a palette. But then I started to write pieces that I felt sounded more universal. And the process for me is many times I start to record a lot, as much live as I can. Because sometimes it's, it's a riff of a flute, a yeah. performance on some, some ethnic instrument that all of a sudden works to picture. It's sometimes it's something that, it, it, it's like the, the process of writing music to picture is very interesting because sometimes you're writing a piece that has nothing to do with the story and somehow it yelps. And the director loves it. Or sometimes you have to do something very, very specific to the genre, the style, the ethnic background, the historic comments, you know, content of the film. So it, it, it's, it's, it's very much a laboratory in my studio. Well, I'm gonna jump ahead of question because you kind of hit on this. Uh, you know, I've, I've watched a bunch of your films now, listened to a lot of your scores. I have to ask, how many different instruments do you play? And do you think that's key for any composer like I'm an array? You hear me showing them. For example, I'll give you a night to get um, Last year, I was invited to go work, as you mentioned before, on Michael Mann. So, why try and um, get it on the screen? Yeah. I'll get it. Do something on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I want to show you guys. When I, when I went to LA, I got a call from Michael Mann. I was staying here in Albuquerque. I got a call. I let my talk to Matt and said, why you, I'm down to LA. So I have my studio in, uh, in Glendale in a warehouse. And sometimes it's, it's having as many instruments as you have in the studio and just recording them and running them through equipment, reverbs and delays and stuff like, to come up with something that the director goes, that's very signature, that's what I want to mind you. Let's, let's start, let's stem from that. As mentioned in your bio, you work with some of the biggest filmmakers in Hollywood, Alexander King and Michael Manders. Uh, how do you navigate the musical workflow when dealing with filmmakers, producers, creating decision makers? Do you have to adapt your process in any way than working on the bigger studio project? Well, well and one thing I can tell you, the bigger the project, the more adapting we're going to have to make. Okay. You've got to go in there knowing that, like, when I work on these films, all I know is that I'm tired today to work on this. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm just here to serve and to try as many things as I've asked to do. You know, and it's painful sometimes because sometimes you do something that you really invested in and then you realize you, you spent two days working on something that's completely the wrong direction. So you have to adapt and go, okay, what's working for you? What's not working for you? How do I get to the place you need to get to? And so um, particularly, for example, when you work on bigger films and you're working with music supervisors, it gets very complicated 
because the music supervisors are basically, they want to control the situation. It's all about control. It's the bit, as, as you go up on the ladder, more and more control is, you start to notice people want now, now control. So, so, you, so sometimes, you know, I would submit, I was very lucky because when I worked on Ferrari, Michael Mann called me, so I say this phone number, boom. Uh, and so I would text them at three in the morning when I was writing an idea because, you know, it was like 11 o'clock, come to Fox, it's 11 p.m., I need to buy tomorrow. So three in the morning, I'm, I'm recording, so I would text him a track, bypassing the music editor so that I would know that he would actually get the track. Right. And so there's a lot of politics involved. And then I worked with the music supervisor very closely. So it, it's a dynamic. You have to, you have to just go very humbly and... Be willing to serve whatever is asked. Yeah. Can you explain that revision process to us? Like, how long does it take from the inception of a demo to the final product we end up seeing on screen? And at what point in the process do you bring in other musicians and orchestration? Well, for me, the one thing that I learned in my industry, um, I spent two years as an intern working for Hans Zimmer. Um, and what I learned in this... Yeah. yeah. Well, like, all the, a lot of Zimmer heads here. That's good. Hey, that's what I, what I learned in this studio was, was the fact that the demos, a lot of work went into the demos, you know, and the technology behind the demos. So that taught me when I went on my own and I started to acquire the equipment to be able to do it, the one thing that I had a conversation with a music supervisor on Ferrari was when I first submitted my first track, Michael Mann set me up in his office and I... Um, when I set up that room and I wrote my first trap, they called me into Fox and they said, Michael wants to listen to your trap. So I'm, I, I go there and I've got the music editor, uh, the, 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 the assistant, I've got the editor who had worked on Transformers and they play my trap. And they started playing, there were multiple other composers here. One of them was Daniel Cabert. And so I'm giving you a long-winded answer, but I'm, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. So when they heard my trap, he really fell in love with some of the elements in the track. And then when they were talking about another track, they said, oh, well, Daniel Peverton in London has written this track for this film. Um, and he said, okay, we'll take the track. He said, well, can we call him and ask him, tell him that you've approved it so now he can call his engineer to mix the track for the film. I learned how to mix and produce so that when they called me and they said, are you going to need an engineer? So now everything I'm delivering is already ready to go. You go to your dumbing step. Yeah. So the process that I work in is that already from the inception of the demos, I'm already working in a way that the director, if he fell in love with something, it's not going to be tapered with, with somebody else. So that everything he's getting from me, if you wanted to take it to a dubbing stage and deliver it on a film, you could. I learned that the hard way when I started working on films with Lisa Gerard on Australian films. Because what I realized is, sometimes you're working on, a, on the music of a, and you do it then, okay? And the director asks you, can you send us some stems? And then they'll grab your stems are basically individualized recordings of a track, let's say guitars, percussion, bass. And so you're working on a film and you write this piece, they go, well, the, the editor wants to work with, the, with your stems. Next thing you know, two weeks go by and you find that they grabbed your stems and mixed them with all kinds of stuff. Music from another artist. And now they give it back to you and they tell you, can you, can you duplicate this? So I learned that if I start to deliver stuff that's already ready to go, mm -hmm. it saves me, I'm, I'm way ahead of getting it. Yeah. So do you think that's essential for composers to be in the mix? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if a composer either aligns himself with a great producer engineer, um, it's, it's a necessary evil. So I, I learned how to mix and master and produce stuff so that I can actually create music from the conception of recording to the final pressed soundtrack that goes to the record label. I subscribe to that. I mean, I, I even think just like bands, you, you want to control the shit. Yeah. Yeah. Every single step is going to modify something. And I don't like surprise. Now, that, this is not one of my questions, but how else are you told to show up at somebody else's makeshift studio and, and not to be able to write from the comfort of your own studio is submit files electronically. It doesn't happen. Yeah, but it sings. It doesn't happen. That's why I moved my studio in my commands. That was great. Built. It was insane. A lot of equipment got damaged. Oh, but uh, thanks to 
I mean, I know I'm advertising here, but thanks to Caldera Electronics here, they've fixed a lot of my gear. The guy there is fantastic. I love it. I tell you, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. How, you mentioned the production. So how much does the production of the sound influence the overall creative vision of the film score? Do you find that some composers are more producer driven and others are more instrument driven? You know, the one thing that I was surprised in LA was that, you know, you get to LA, you think this is, you're at the top of the food chain. And I would go to some of these meetings and meet like guys, I, you know, uh, before I started working as a full-time composer, I got into the computer industry to make money to find this one city. And so what happened was, is that since I was in the music industry, people started refining, and I had interned for Hans Zimmer, people started buying a lot of gear from me. And I ended up selling gear. I, had, I, I sold to the movie studios. They were my clients, like Disney. I had the Apple account with Disney. And so I was in that. But on the side, since I wanted to meet more people in, in my field, I ended up selling to all the top composers in, in Holly like Jameson Mauer, Thomas Newman, and all of these guys. I had Billy Gibbons used to come, Stevie Wonder was my client. And that's how I got to know, to go to some of these people's studios and, and, and learn their process. And the one thing that surprised me, that actually amazed me, is how inept composers are when it comes to spending the money on the right tools to get the right results. They're always trying to cut corners. And so when you get a bigger project, they would hire these designated, designated um, engineers. For example, Alan Meyerson, who I'm a huge fan of, who I know personally, he's mixed all the big Hans in their soundtracks in the last 25, 30 years. And so I would go to, his, I would go to Hans' studio and just sit with him and watch what he was doing. Because what happened was this, is when I went on my own, somebody gave me Hans Zimmer's personal sample library. I knew people, so I had it on my, what they called back then, Giga Stick. Now I remember I would write music with his sounds, but then I would go to the movie theater and I would, and I would hear his sound. And I would say, how is it that his stuff sounds so amazing? And my stuff, which is his sounds, sounds horrible. And that's what started to incentivize me to realize that 90% of the time when I have a director walks into my studio, go, it's all about creating what they call ear tin. Something that sounds so intriguing, so unique, that they fall in love with it. And that's what's gonna nail you the job. Mm -hmm. That you are creating something so unique and so signature for that specific project that they go, I wanna work with this guy. And also allowing people to come into your space, mm -hmm. like I do. For example, I worked on this film recently and the producer came, I said, music's written, it's recorded, everything's ready to go. Now let's have fun. What do you want to change? What do you want to do? I want to grab this footer here. Okay, let's grab. Who? Do you like this? Yeah, I want it, but I want it in this scene. Great, let's do that. And you assemble an entire, you reassemble a score with a client next to you, giving them that facility, that, that capacity. All of a sudden, people realize they start having fun. They're like, when I first meet directors, a lot of them tell me, I don't know anything about music. And I always tell them, I don't either. And well, let's discover this together. So we sit. By the time we're done, they hug me, they tell me, this has been the most fun I've ever had because we wrote music together. We're actually writing music together. It's not about me, it's about us writing music together. Well, that just speaks to like the collaborative nature of filmmaking. It's, yeah, it's, it makes it special. Well, what happens too is, if a director walks into your studio, regardless of what you do, whether you're an editor or sound guy, whatever, and he feels intimidated, if he feels that, oh, I don't know anything about music, I don't want to, I don't want to ask a question. That guy, if he meets another guy that he feels comfortable with asking those questions, even if he's not as talented as you, he's going to end up working with no. you. Because these guys want to walk into your space and they want to know that they can have anything happen. And there's not a question that is dumb or I don't know enough or anything. You, it's a very... Very, very delicate dynamic you have to have with creatives. It's kind of interesting. I have a piece here that I did not know what Breaking Bad was when we hired him to stone. And so I got you lose. So I got We were working on this Australian film, and they sent this, this piece over with, as a temp score. And so I listened to it, and they sent me the piece individually. I had no idea it was for a 
to break you back. And, um, and so I naturally did what I was asked. So that was the like spark man. Like the music too. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, producing what it what allows you to do when you when you understand the process of how things salute is really important because when we're working on a film, unless say, for example you get a temp score like in a situation like this. If I didn't know how to record those guitars and get exactly the same lot or thing, you could potentially lose the gig. I like that suite too. What what was that movie called? No, the movie's called Burning Man, and it was uh, it won the Academy Award for Best Score in Spain. Mm -hmm. And it's a Gerard. Yeah. Do you have any other clips you want to show? I have a lot of stuff. It all depends on what, where you want to go. I mean, you know, um, I've written a lot of music in the trailer industry. That's how I started out. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about um, how do you get work? When I first started to set up my studio and I started to create, you know, I, the one thing that was important was that I was always going to the studio and writing music. I was always writing music. And so when I went on my own, um, I started to reach out to other publishers. And because I had a large body of work, I was able to meet with two publishers and they said, first they asked me if I own them in the Do you own them? I said, yes, I do. And so they said, so I got signed with a publisher right away. And they started to send my music out to all the major networks. And very soon I started to land gigs, uh, license, license. So people started paying for my music. And so getting those credits from licenses opened a lot of doors so that I could go to a meeting and say, well, you know, I know Mr. So-and-so, I know you have your composer and you're working on a hundred million dollar film, but they just paid a lot of money to license my, my music to advertise your $100 yeah. million dollar film. So getting in with publishers who are worldwide, um, you know, really helped them open a lot of doors to start being. Yeah, that's amazing. And I had this in the question, you just answered the question, but everyone should know what trailers you've licensed. I, it just blew my mind. But Avatar, Avengers Endgame, Mission Impossible 3, Chris of Persia, National Treasure, Hellboy, Monsters vs. Alien, like the list just goes on and on. So you license all that stuff through the publishers. They have yep. made it. Right. I, it's kind of funny. It's being in the computer industry, I was designing these systems for composers, and so everybody started buying from me. And so I had my play, I used to have, a, I, I worked in corporate sales, but I, all these guys used to come over to me. And so one time I met these guys that were starting this publishing company, and they knew that I had uh, interned at Hans and so they asked me, they wanted to hear some of my stuff. I presented them some material that I had written in Hans's room, and they were like, do you want to write some tracks for us? And next thing I knew, they sent my tracks to the Seattle Symphony Orchestra with Quadkers. Like, oh my God. And before I knew it, I got a call that said, your music is licensed for help, boy. <laughs> you know, so. But part of it's also being in that environment. Yeah. Yeah, what, well, you know, because my first question is, how do you get in the mindset to write licensing music? Is it 
Yeah, it's got to be different time in film school. Well, what I learned, and these, these are the, the tricks of the trade, like when, when I met a lot of the trailer guys, they said, we want you to write an entire two-hour soundtrack in two and a half. <laughs> okay, you know, and I was like, okay, so that's exactly what I said. And so I learned a lot of different formats of how to deliver music and styles. For example, when I worked on God of War, it was a complete different style of writing music. You know, I was talking to uh, the young woman here. Uh, still, and she asked me and said, writing for games is, you have to write music that sounds like you're going somewhere, but you never get there. You know, it's like, this continues, we're gonna go somewhere, but it never happens. And then you, you write a bunch of cues that are actually, I got you. Wow. You know, and it's, it's, it's a very tedious process. Whereas when you, when you write for trailers, you gotta write an intro, and then you gotta throw everything in the kitchen sink within two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Then there, there's a formula. Yeah, totally formula. Sound takes longer to get than picture. So I always have within a few frames a bit of space to hit something on the nose. So I, I you know, I can move things around, but I'm, you know, I mean, I, I, I believe in music having movement and being choreographed to picture. But, but for example, on trailers, what I would do, and this is a great exercise for people, if you're writing music, like, I would grab trailers from other, from other productions, and I would put them in my system, and I would write to those pictures. And I do that all the time. Sometimes when I'm writing even an album, I'm working on an album right now with a bunch of really famous artists from all over the world. I'm, I'm writing all the music, I'm producing it here in Albuquerque, and I'm getting files from all over the world. And so what I'm doing, sometimes when I'm lacking inspiration, I'm going, I'm not hitting the mark. I'll go online, I'll find something that inspires me, I'll download it, put it in my system, and start looking at it. And sometimes just having that visual anchor really gets you into a creative space where you go, okay, I, now it's working, you know? Because it, let's face it, I mean, it's no longer just about music. It's no longer just about movies. It's no longer just about, you know, I mean, it's all about delivering one entire vision. And so if I'm able to help a filmmaker, help them do that, then, then, then he's going to want to work with me. He's going to go, you know what, it's so easy working with this guy, and he gives me a lot of ideas, and so we're able to get a better, better result as a result of working with this person. Yeah, you had touched on uh, the God of War video game, and um, so I kind of want to dive there for a little bit, because I've never composed for video games. I can just imagine your deliverables are dozens of hours of music, not, not, not just two hours or less, correct? We spend a year working on it. Yeah, what is that? process like and then you know to create music that needs to adapt and evolve with the game players choices right mm -hmm. like, how, how do you even well i mean it's it's you i mean when you're working on projects like that there's a, there's a lot of support at the same time you have music editors and music supervisors that give you samples and develop this you know we've spent because that's what the music editors do and music supervisors they kind of work with the creatives before they have a composer so that when they hire a composer, they're not telling you, they're not sending him on all kinds of bottle boost checks, you know, because it takes time to produce snow So, so um, you know, you, you're given, we're going for this style, we like this, we were kind of, you know, for example, like uh, a gentleman I know, his, his name's Inan Zor. He's very, he's a very well-established game, game composer. Yeah. And so I went to his house in the San Fernando Valley one time when we did, and met him at, and I said, yeah, I'd love to come by. And he was, and he played me this, this, this thing, I just finished this thing. I said, yeah, I know, you completely ripped off Danny Elfman from Planet of the Eats. That's what they wanted. The game company came and said, we really want this to sound like Planet of the Apes, with Danny Elfman from Planet of the Apes. And so he did to, as much legally as he could. Yeah. To not like Sue. And that happens a lot in this year. I get demos all the time where I want this exact same thing. And I'm like, okay, I got to change any key and reverse this thing. And, uh, yeah. For example, there's a track I did which for a, a short, actually a short, where they wanted Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I don't know. Is it the good Pink Floyd or the early? Yeah, the uh, Dark Seven Moon, the, okay. the piece called, um, Sorry, I think it's called Read. Oh yeah. That's why I really emphasize on production because you know how to record and you know 
you can listen to a recording and you said, all right, I know the client wants this, he loves this guitar or this violin or this whatever, I have to put it in the same place because they're tempting this music and the dialogue of the film is sitting here and he's hearing this guitar that's coming on the right channel. If I don't get that guitar on that right channel, he's gonna, he's gonna kick this thing away. Mm -hmm. So if you gotta get that guitar, it's gotta sound exactly with it, the way that guitar sounds. Mm -hmm. and you know, so that's a great aspect of what we do. It's a lot of it's architecture. And sound alikes, yeah, but yeah. specifically on sound alikes, I'm just curious. And then you bring in your own personality, you know, you're yeah. bringing your own vision. I had a guy one time like, contact me and he said to me, we're doing the music for this trailer, we'd love to hire you. We want something that sounds exactly like The Dark Knight by tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, so, okay, so for 99 cents, you downloaded from iTunes a track, you put it on your movie, you love the way it looks. And you want me to duplicate the London Symphony Orchestra a month's worth of work, slaves, like to Mont. But there, you know. And, but sometimes that's what people are, and that, that's what they demand. So just to jump a little bit, um, I know you recently moved here from LA. What was it about New Mexico that drew you in? And, and how do you still stay connected and continue to network with Hollywood? Well, thanks to the COVID, um, one of the blessings in Sparum is that it, it, it destroyed the whole concept that somebody has to be in my studio, even though I love it. So Zoom has, has really opened up the gate, the, flood, the floodgates for a lot of creators worldwide. And so that was one aspect. Number two, I was tired of Los Angeles. It was, uh, it was just, I wasn't inspiring anymore. It was chaotic. Um, and so in 2020, uh, my agent was sending out information about my stuff. And a gentleman from New Mexico contacted me and he said he wanted to start a business here. And so I came out, and then I was invited to speak at the Farmington Film Festival, and I fell in love with Farmington. I just love the energy, the vibe. And then I found out that New Mexico has its incentives, and you know, for example, in LA, nobody has any. You know, we don't get rebate time. And I, 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 I saw that the film industry here, I think, has a lot of potential, and I. And I honestly, I'm saying this very, very honestly, I thought, well, I'd be much of greater service to a community like Alpha where I could potentially meet, 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 meet creatives that haven't had the opportunity that I haven't. Like when I arrived in LA, I, I, if anybody can, if I can do it, anybody else can, because I had every single door closed to me. I knocked on every single door in that town. Yeah. And somehow, through perseverance and passion for what I do, the really was enough for what I do. I started to meet people and people helped me. And so when I came here and I saw that it climbed, you know, the, the environment, I thought, well, I'd love to be, I'd love to meet somebody that was like me and have somebody like me. In other words, if somebody's really struggling, like the way I was, I would love to have somebody tell me, you know what, you could do this and this, and it could, it could change your life. Yeah. So I thought I'd be a better, I mean, plenty of people are making money in LA, but if I can hire somebody here, who's just as talented as somebody in LA, and help them create a community of really talented, like-minded people here, I think I'd be a greater service to this area. Like being in LA with all the jaded composers that are all complaining, and they're all saying the same old story, I think there's a lot of room to grow. And so, let's turn the out. Yeah, I might have been wrong in this. I, I was under the impression that uh, Hollywood likes to come and do the productions here, and then they like to go back to California for a lot of the post production as well. But yeah, if you can peel off film score and keep that here. I'm all. Well, I mean, to, to, to contest that, when I, when I left LA, I actually went to Nashville. I drove to Nashville. Because I thought it's a music industry town. I was kind of burnt out in LA. I was getting a lot of films abroad. Clients were calling me from abroad. I was like, why am I paying all this money to have this house in Pasadena where a director would come once? I'm paying this huge overhead. Um, director would come once, and then when I started uploading files, hey dude, up in Santa Monica, it's gonna be two and a half, three hours to get to your house. Can you just upload it? And I realized, so why am I even in LA when I'm getting films from Australia, from Kazakhstan, from so I went to Nashville and I, I loved the city, it's a beautiful city, but things just didn't jive and I'd been to Farmington. And so I came here 
And then I realized, I said, you know, if, you, if you're willing to put the work out there, network, you could be in. It's really up to you. There's so many resources to you. You know, if a composer gets together with filmmakers, and for example, one thing that I've done, I started producing artists. And so what I did, I was working on a film they're going to be releasing soon. It's this goth kind of thriller film. And so I was working with the singer, and I went to the filmmakers and I said, I want to make a music video with your footage. And use this footage to shoot part of it in my house in Pasadena, the artist. We promote your film, I promote the artist, and we all help each other. You know, and so there's a lot of things that, that musicians can do with filmmakers and with, that, that they can tap into to help each other. Which is, and all these resources are available. Yeah, I'm like, what? Let me show you those resources. Like, let me show you part of the video, just so you get an idea. Okay. This guy shot a Mimi in LA, and I knew they were shooting this me, and I said, okay, you let me edit this footage, and I can do this. You promote two-time Grammy winner, Seika, and we'll promote this. We shot her in my house in Pasadena, and the footage is all shot. She didn't like it. So what I'm saying is, even musicians can hook up with filmmakers and create content and help each other. They create a community that's self-sustainable. This is all footage for me, at the end. So this one on your social medias? Yeah, this is on my social out and when you say how do you get work sometimes you have to create the work that will eventually like for example a video I did with her I I was inspired by Asian films I did a track I I was up for a film a big Chinese film that I lost um, and they asked me to do a demo and so I really loved the demo and add something and I asked be allowed to sing on and so as a result of having done a demo for this Chinese film I thought well why don't I just grab some Chinese imagery from famous films and put this video together and so that we have something to show and it was that video that landed me this not that you so so using the internet as a resource as a young composer i mean how do you get this video seen by the decision maker and say no well sometimes you you know there's a lot of resources that you can there's a lot of resources that are where they're looking for composers they're looking for something that those are you know, they said, Albuquerque, yeah, I'm sure if you do your homework and you, and you, and you do your legwork, you're going to run into a lot of film that you wouldn't just on the know what you know. So, so it's, it's crucial to have something online where you can just say, and, and if you have a lot of content, the key is working, is creating a lot of material that can be focused for multiple markets. So that by the time you meet that person, I've got the life track of this. Let me send them this. But you've done the work. If you don't show people how things can actually look, they, they're never gonna. They're never gonna hide. You've got to be able to sound like the expensive people, and you got to be able to look like the expensive people. So if they, so if they hire you, you have a job. Yeah. Well, thinking about your non-film score albums, do, do you feel for composers to release solo albums helps or it yeah, probably helps, not hinders their film score career? Is it important to release your own music to like stay relevant or just to help find your voice? You think? Composer should be doing that more often. Well, for me, for me, the thing that allows me to be of service to filmmakers is the fact that I have a release, a thousands, a pressure release to create my own album. Mm-hmm. In other words, I get to do whatever anybody tells me to. And so when I release them, I'm able to sit with filmmakers and go, "Let's do what you want." 
Because I don't have that thing where, because I remember when I went on my own, the first year I went on my own, um, I remember I had an office in Koreatown next to a dentist. I was writing horror terms. And I was operationalist right next to my office. So um, I used to hear kids yelling, and I thought, this is because of my music, or they're getting the. Yeah, I used to actually pull that. So, but I spent the year by myself, and in that year, I was able to release the right and do. I worked on a couple of films during that year, but I also spent a lot of time releasing all that bent up creative energy that I hadn't been able to yet. See, once you do that, then you're, you can be at the service of, of other people. So the albums allow me to have absolute complete creative license. The albums I've done with Lisa Gerard. That was my next question. Yeah. She's, she's given me absolute complete creative license. Okay. She, she'll send me vocals. She loves what I do, and and I'm able to create things, and, and then we collaborate on this, so that then when things sound inspired, because no one's controlling, or sometimes when you're working on films, things can be very stifling. Uh -huh. Sometimes you might have written this really beautiful piece, and they go, "We're gonna re-edit the, the the film," it's so that that beautiful art just got destroyed. Yeah. So when you write these pieces of music. Um, that are inspired and they're, and they're not controlled by other people and you're having your own say, those are, the, those, are, those are the pieces of music that then people start to put up against picture. Mm -hmm. And they call you and they go, you did this album and we're using that piece of music on this scene. Oh, would, you guys, cool. would you guys like to do the music for our movie? For example, on Jane Got a Gun. Jane Got a Gun, I didn't release to art. She had just done an album with um, Deck and Dance. There was a piece called She Can Eat. That's very famous. And Gavin O'Connor was director on Jane Got a Gun, was in an office in Burbank, which I ended up going to beat times. And he was walking out of his office, and the music editor, Pete Snell, next to his office, was playing She Can And he heard it, he goes, that's the music from my movie. And as a result of that, they called Lisa Gerard and they said, would Deck and Dance want to score Jane Got a Gun? She said, no, I work with Marcello and Francesi. We're going to score. Next thing I knew, I was going to make it. All because of peace that came out on an YouTube Yeah. So it's all about creating and putting it out there. The more you put out there, the mentions you see. Now, for Lisa, um, how, did, how did you guys meet? And would you consider her your muse in some way? I mean, oh, how many so albums? How many albums have you guys done? Like three? Well, we've worked on 10 films in three albums. We're, I'm working on a third album. All right. Okay. No, I, I'm a fourth. So, yeah. Um, so how, how did you, you guys meet? But it's a funny story. It's a real funny story because I heard, I, mean, I, I was living in the coast of Spain many years ago and a friend of mine sent me a cassette of Becky Dance. And I remember hearing this music. I was very young, was to me. And I heard this singer and I thought to myself, if I could work with this singer, I would produce her better than anybody. He mean, that's what I thought. Many, twice. Even in, in the universe, the, of all the things, I never thought of it to me. So I was in LA, it was, I'll tell you, it's a funny story. I was in LA, it was 2008, and I didn't know where my landscape was coming from. But I was hanging in there. So I went to the desert and spent five days in the desert, non Zabarago. Just, I said, I don't know what's going to happen. Prior to that, I'd gone to Ramado where I met a composer that was working. We said, Gerard, and I had invited him to my studio offering him my services as a producer engineer. And so I didn't have any coverture in my song and I had no idea how I was going to get my next gig, but I was going to stick to my guns and continue to do what I love because this is what I was going to do. And as I'm driving back to LA from the desert, I get, I see I have a message on my phone. I pick up the message and this composer calls me saying, we've got Lisa Gerard coming into town. She's working on a TV show for NBC with Francis Lawrence, who directed all the Wonder Bands. Okay. Can we use your studio for recording stuff? And the next day, I literally have Lisa Gerard walking into my studio. And we just connected right away. I was a huge fan of her work. And I was there as an engineer, so I was very respectful. But one evening, you know, she had heard that I said that I was a composer. She asked me, she said, I'd like to hear his new music, and I played on my music, and she said, we got to work today. I'm looking at what's the big one. He was awesome. But that took many years of a lot of failures. I mean, that just didn't happen. I mean, I failed 
many, 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 many times on many, 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 many opportunities. Did, did you also so something? Had, sorry, something had to stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about that? I mean, you have to have thick skin to, to do anything in the, in the arts. You know, especially the art as it comes. It's not everyone is built for it. You know, um, at one point in my life, I was a graphic designer, and just to set aside my ego for the betterment of a project and take revision notes. You know, you have to learn all these kind of skills to to even be able to cross and to stick around. Them. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, look, I when I when I arrived in LA, I didn't to make my nice family place. Okay, I, I you know I realized after working for my husband for two years, I said, if I don't make my own luck and I don't get my own studio, these guys are never going to be a cheat. Because it's very close knit. And so I worked in an industry, I made money, made good money, invested it all in my studio, worked for five years where I worked a regular job and I would work at nighttime, literally did not sleep for fun. And, and I, now, what are you doing in that studio? Uh, when? Well, when I, when I started to make money, I got an office very close to where I was working. And I started, I remember I spent a considerable amount of money of a bunch of gear I didn't even know how to use. I got a bunch of boxes and started figuring out how to connect it, how to make it sound, and then ground zero. And then, you know, I started to write my own tracks at nighttime and all this stuff. And then I, and I had a cushy job. I went to good restaurants. I took vacations and all that. But I was miserable. I remember Sunday afternoons at three o'clock in the afternoon when I realized that I'd have to go to this job that absolutely hated some of those. You know, and I'm, so, so what's the alternative? Living a life where you're, you know, you're comfortable, but yet you're miserable inside? I can't let that lie to It's just why I pursued what I did. Because it's, I wake up in the morning on Sunday afternoons, I can't wait till it's mine. See mm-hmm. That's the kind of life. That doesn't. I'm curious. Yeah. That's why I do what I do. So I, I know, like me, you went to school for visual arts. Yeah. Now, do you think something in that background, you know, you picked down your paintbrushes, picked up instruments, what led you to do that? And then do you think that there's something that's connected, there's some connected tissue between the two? Well, I was a huge music fan. And, you know, I discovered quite young that soundtracks, because I wasn't into John Williams, honestly. I could, it, was, it was too complex for me, and I wanted something more melodic. I now appreciate John Williams and love his music. But at the time, it was too, it was too bombastic for me. Yeah. Know? So I remember hearing a score for a film called Cat People. It was, it was composed by a composer called Georgia Murat. He was a oh, yeah. producer. I guess. He made some like a big allo disco. In but, the, yeah. So I remember listening to that score, and I was drawn. And so I, while I was painting, I started to discover soundtrack as I was, and I was listening to soundtracks all the time. And one day I thought, because I, I started playing guitar at 13 and I, I went to orchestra class, but I never really took music seriously. But one day I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could create my own music Mike while I'm painting? And so I started pursuing it. Next thing I knew, I was so deep into music, I didn't want to paint it. <laughs> so what would you like make? Four track cassette tapes or something back in the day to work up. Absolutely. I found I was living across the Spain and I met this guy who was a Hungarian Argentinian Jewish gentleman who, who was a real estate dude, he had a lot of money. And then I'm part of RGT. So he, we, we connected and he liked me and he was like, come over to my house, meet my wife and my kid. And he had a little studio in his basement and we started doing music. We ended up being an album. I mean, that's how it all started. You know? In the end, those two years. Yeah, and then you know, we, that album, they, they got licensed. They ended up getting licensed for the television in, in Spain. Uh, and that's what I realized. I said, I think this, I float better with music. And so having an American passport, I mean, being born in here, I was living in the coast of Spain. I said, I'm going to go to LA and see if I'm going to pursue it. That is crazy. He said, I just went to the range. Strong for a number of kids. I don't know how to describe this number one. I know you also, you do music supervision too. You want to talk about how, how's that truly to play? How do you approach that child differently? Well, I mean, it's all about providing music. For example, as a music supervisor on this last film, I know a lot of musicians in LA. I was able to license two pieces from a band though, and the spell. So I'm always listening to artists because as someone who's involved in bringing music to a film, 
there's times, a lot of times where, for example, there's a bar seat and they need music. They can't use conventional music. So I'll contact my buddies who have bands and go, look, I need a track for we need. And sometimes those tracks could turn into some things where I could tell the creatives, go, look, we need your stems because I need to, for example, on a film, uh, they were working with this, this, this musician and I ended up grabbing their stems and placing them in other areas of the film and helping the filmmaker go, you know what, we can grab this music here that you have in there that you've already paid for and we could place it here and I can help you by that's it. And so it's, it's, it, it, it all comes together that the more services you can provide a client, the, the easier it is for them. And so it's going to lock you with them because they're like, if I hire them, I'll have to worry about all this stuff. Yeah. And, the, and the same with, like, you're a mastering engineer. You, yeah. Now, in my mind, when I saw that, that you mastered many albums for Lake Shore Records, I love Lake Shore Records, Jack. Yeah. You did some great work. Yeah. I have. So, I mean, I'm sure that just falls to the same, you know, how so you, composers need to be a jack in one trades, you gotta learn every skill that you can get. Well, I mean, I, I've spent time in running email, too. I know. <laughs> because it's what I have to deliver. And so, I have a friend of mine, he's an Italian composer from Rome, he lives in LA, he very good friends. He did the music for Kronisha. Oh, that's a fact. And so when they were gonna, he had done a movie called, at least under, under the same name, it was a very famous Mexican film, beautiful film. And so he had been to my studio. I mean, this is how these things happen. And so he said, um, he didn't have a studio, he, he works in his bedroom, you know, and he, cause he writes all in paper. So when he saw my studio, he said, Lakeshore Records wants to do an interview of me behind the scenes about my process of composing the music for under the same moon. So he came to my studio and the head of Lakeshore Records walked into my studio with those, what do you do? Like, well, I do compose, but I also master. I said, and so as a result of that, I ended up mastering like seven, eight records for Lakeshore Records. That's awesome. Yeah. Until I couldn't do it anymore because I was writing music. So, so my book came out. So I, I came to the West Side. How do you approach mastering? I mean, is it, of course, it's a different mindset. What, what are you thinking about when you're mastering? Well, mastering is the final mix to any recording. You know, you, you could master a soundtrack, you could master a film, audio, like, you know, the dialogue and the music and the sound effects. Mm -hmm. All that takes mastering. Basically, what you do is you balance out all the frequencies and you filter out frequencies that are going to deprive that recording from having any distortion in most systems out there so that it's cohesive so that if I turn it on my TV or you turn it on your TV it's going to translate well. The key is translation and that's why for example as a composer it's been key for me to learn that because if I write a piece of music in my studio and it sounds great to the director and he goes back to his kind and he goes it doesn't sound the same in my home. You've got a problem. That's why I learned how to master, because it's all about translation. Does my audio translate well into your headphones? Does my audio translate way, well into your car? I'm sending music to Michael Mann that is listening to his car. If it doesn't sound good, he's going to fire me. So mastering basically you know, is, is, a, is, is a collection of equalizers and compressors and limiters that allow the sound to sound pristine without distortion, you have all the clarity, and that you're meeting all the frequencies so that you're at commercial level. So when it goes into YouTube, it doesn't get kicked back. When a record label gets in, it doesn't get kicked back. And no matter where you listen to it, it's gonna sound good. Yeah, even on your iPhone, so like more and more people. Lisa Gerard is a tech negated individual. And she does not do technology. And I deal with a lot of artists that way. So I have to send her, a, I have to text her an MP3 that she's going to listen to her iPods. Choosing. You know, and I deal with quite a few, a number of artists that are very well known that they rely on their engineer. And they want to hear something, I have to text an MP3 to them. And he's got to sign it. That'd be it. So. All right, can you uh, can, uh, switch gears here a little bit? Try something? All right. Is this something I'd like to call the rapid fire composer questionnaire? And, and <laughs> can you get some uh, delay echo on this mic for one time? The rapid fire composer questionnaire. And, 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 you know, that's what we're getting a, a chat. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, so, you know, these will just be short answers. If you can't limit to just one answer, that's okay. You can do two things. Your favorite composer. Beethoven. Okay. 
Favorite film score that's not our own? Yeah. Okay. Blade Runner. Me, you went to enjoy it. Yeah. What, what do you use on that uh, do ARB? That 2600? I think the same. You do, you did very good. <laughs> uh, favorite film score that is your own? It's probably the one you're working on. I'm yet to compose it. Two. Eight. Uh, what's your favorite instrument to compose on? Can. Yeah. The catch. Favorite instrument to break the audience's heart? Spanish guitar. Sorry. Okay. Favorite instrument to creep out an audience? Heart. Head. Okay. Okay. Favorite instrument to hype the audience up? Percussion. Yeah. Uh, favorite instrument to be transparent, just floating in the back end of the sea? Shouldn't count. Uh, what is your favorite piece of studio gear? Oh, that's a hard. It shouldn't be free. <laughs> yeah. Outdoor gear as much as I can get it. Nice, nice. Family, family, and kill. Oh, um, okay. The only man I know is the box box. After we can. Um, this is for me. What's your favorite plugin? Renaissance Harbor Use Cardi. Really? Yeah. I'm so in the bar. Out of the bar. I use them. I love it. I know. Yeah. Get out of the bar. Um, what is your most used plugin? I'm sorry? Most used plugin? Renaissance King. Okay. Uh, favorite music library? Do you even use music library? Yeah, I do. I, I, With your arsenal, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a ton. I mean, I, I actually like Symphobia a lot. Okay. Symphobia's got some great stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Some folio. But I record a lot of stuff live. I, I sometimes it's kind of wild to me because I I don't I don't sometimes even consider myself a musician, but sometimes I listen to something like I'm the one playing everything in this. How do we get today? Oh. Yeah. Look at I have Paul Lucifer. Yeah. Have have you ever sampled yourself? Like create your own sample libraries and stuff? I've tuned what has I found it. This, um, <laughs> maybe we'll do some Oh show you some sampling and stuff. Uh, so, for the layman out there, a DAW is the digital audio workstation. That's the music software we use to produce and compose. What is your preferred DAW for composing? Cheapers. Is that the same, your preferred DAW for mixing? I mix, I mix and I compose in Cubase and I master it in Pro Tools. So I knew there was going to be a Pro Tools in there. Okay. And you know, Pro Tools is really handy when you're working with Tempe. Yeah. Because the video engine of Pro Tools, since they're owned by Abbott, it's very easy for me to send deliverables to clients. 90% of the time, I'm sending deliverables to clients in Pro Tools. I'll write in Cubase, import in the Pro Tools, and then send things in Pro Tools. Also because of the sound. It's an industry sound, so, you know, music supervisor is not going to commit any, any blood burden. And when I export in a Pro Tools, it's good off my hands. Yeah. yeah. Last question for you. This is from Best with Tim. Who's your favorite AFMX interviewer? <laughs> Uh, uh. Mr. Sean, wow. Perfect score. Perfect score, man. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. So I'm on the phone. Okay. You, you want an opportunity to plug your next project. What are you working on? I'm right now working on a film that was shot in Kazakhstan. It's, uh, they're doing this, they're, it's, a, it's a franchise. I can't say the name of it, but it's a franchise about a detective that, um, existed in during the um, Soviet Union. It's a fascinating suspense thriller, and I'm writing music for that, and I'm very grateful to have Lisa sing them. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming to this dark thing. Can I get him back? 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 Can I get him back